Welcome to the Deutsches Tank Museum for another in the series Inside the Tanks. Today, one of the vehicles we're going to take a closer look at is this, the Sturmpanzer VI, often referred to as the Sturmtiger or Assault Tiger. The first thing to say is that it is not a tank. It is a self-propelled artillery piece, specifically a very large caliber mortar designed to be used to smash strong fortifications. But before we get onto this particular beast, it is worth exploring where the whole idea came from. Providing close support to the attacking infantry was something which has always been a tank's role, right from the start. But as tanks evolved to fight tanks, the job was gradually taken over by specialist armoured artillery pieces or assault guns. The German army was certainly the earliest serious promoter of the idea, although it was taken up by others over time. The classic assault gun was the Sturmgeschütz, armed with a short 75mm howitzer. But when Stugs were rearmed with the long 75mm gun to turn them into anti-tank weapons, it left the infantry without the close support it needed. Developments using existing tank chassis were obvious moves, and the first was the Sturmpanzer IV, or Brumbeer, mounting a 150mm gun on a modified Mark IV chassis. But the real daddy was this, the Sturmtiger. First proposed in 1943, it got into more serious production in late 1944. In all, only about 18 were actually built, mounted on chassis from the late model Tiger I. These were both available and felt to be superfluous, since the Tiger II was taking over. So let's take a closer look back at this beast. And what a beast it is weighing in about 65 tonnes, over seven tonnes heavier than a Tiger I, and only three tonnes short of a Tiger II. The most notable thing about the Sturmtiger was, of course, this gun. The 380mm Sturmmörser RW61. It had been developed from a naval depth charge thrower and used a two-stage rocket propellant system. The first smaller charge simply blew the projectile clear of the short barrel, then a second solid fuel stage ignited, blasting the projectile onward. And it could throw this 1.5 metre long, 350 kilo projectile between 4,000 and 6,000 metres. Depending on the exact type of projectile, it could penetrate up to eight feet of reinforced concrete. Not surprisingly, there weren't many fortifications that could resist it. This ring of smaller holes around the muzzle is to allow the escape of gases from the first charge. Clearly they cannot be vented back into the crew compartment and the pressure was too great for them to be contained in the gun, so they were turned through 180 degrees and vented forwards. This, plus the large flash from the secondary propellant, made it easy to spot the location of a Sturmtiger when it fired, so it was unadvisable to stick around too long afterwards. The sheer size of the ammunition meant that only 14 rounds could be carried, maximum. And even this was only possible if there was a round in the breech and another on the loading tray. So more often than not, the vehicle went into action with only 13 rounds. Getting the rounds into the tank was a job and a half for all four crew members and a crane mounted on the rear deck. As was also becoming common practice in the design of tank hunters, the new superstructure was a casemate style with a sloping glasses plate. The frontal armour was 150 millimetres compared to 100 millimetres on the standard Tiger. Elsewhere on the hull, it varied between 60 and 100 millimetres, so it was a pretty tough nut. As far as the chassis was concerned, it is pure late model Tiger I, with the overlapping metal road wheels and other modifications. Overall dimensions are about the same as the Tiger I, except the Sturmtiger is slightly lower and shorter. The engine was also the same, the Maybach HL230. Access was straightforward, two hatches on the top and one on the rear of the superstructure. The long rectangular hatch above the loader and the gun was for loading the ammunition.
Here inside, the crew of four basically had similar positions to those in the tank. The driver was at the front on the left, but higher up than that in the tank. This necessitated the mounting of the gun in an offset position to the right. The gunner sat to the left of the gun with the commander at the back. The loader was to the right. For close in defence against infantry, there was a standard MG34 mounted at the front and operated by the loader, who was also the radio man in his spare time. Look at the amount of room inside the fighting compartment. However, taking into consideration those massive projectiles that we saw outside would also be stowed left and right in here in these cradles. Just to my left shoulder we can see the elevation hand wheel and just to the right of that of course is the breech of this humongous gun. Also an interesting thing to know, if you look underneath the breech you can see something which you don't see very often, the torsion bar suspension. The Sturmtiger first saw action during the Warsaw Uprising in August 1944, when a couple of prototypes were rushed there. So its first outing was in its designed role, infantry support in built-up areas. After that, three companies of assault mortars were formed and saw action on the Western Front in the final months of the war. Not a lot is known of their performance. One unconfirmed report speaks of a Sturmtiger taking out three M4 Shermans. Of course, they suffered from the same issues that affected Tigers as a whole, lack of power and mechanical unreliability. As a result, some were simply abandoned when they broke down or when they ran out of ammunition and couldn't be resupplied. In the end, the Sturmtiger was a formidable idea and no doubt formidable in its designed role. However, by the time it got into production, the war was very much already more mobile and Germany was on the defensive meaning that the opportunity to assault enemy fortifications was never going to happen.